Good morning, church. Please turn in your Bibles to Colossians 3, verse 17. I will be reading through chapter 4, verse 1. And if you've been tracking with our series in Colossians, you will notice that we've already preached through this passage, speaking to the different roles that are addressed here. So husband and wife, father and children, master and bondservant. And this message isn't going to focus on one of those specific categories, but is instead on the broader topic of obedience. Specifically, it can be easy to see these three categories as an exhaustive list, that this is all we have to do to obey. But obedience is not something limited to life at home or life in the workplace. It's something that should characterize the Christian. Instead of obeying when they have to, a Christian has a heart of obedience. And because of this, the pastors wanted someone who didn't fit into these categories to bring this message. And as the single unemployed person who's still living with their parents, I was the one who was called upon. So that's why I'm here this morning. But in all honesty, I am really grateful to do this, and I am hoping and excited that God uses this to stir our hearts to obedience. So please read with me in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Please pray with me. Lord, you know that I am not qualified to bring a message on obedience. Too often, my life is in the pattern of disobedience, not obedience. And I fail to practice what Colossians teaches. But God, I thank you for grace that I am standing here not because I've earned my way here, because I'm an example of obedience, but because of your perfect obedience. And that obedience then has been placed on me through your grace. So I thank you for your mercies new every morning. And I pray that you'd stir each one of us to obey you, that you'd give us a heart of obedience. Anoint me and fill me with your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul packs this passage we just read with references to Christ. Even though it's primarily about our responsibility as Christians, seven times in these nine verses, Paul places Christ as the end point of our obedience, in the name of the Lord Jesus, through him, fearing the Lord, and more. Paul is showing that obedience is not taking your eyes off Christ and putting them on yourself. It's keeping your eyes on Christ as you strive to follow him. My goal in this message is to fit obedience into the larger plan of God for us. When we disconnect obedience from God's order and from God himself, we will miss true obedience, obedience that is from the heart. Kevin DeYoung, in his book, The Whole in Our Holiness, talks about how we can separate the gospel from obedience. He says, my fear is that as we rightly celebrate and in some quarters rediscover all that Christ has saved us from, we are giving little thought and making little effort concerning all that Christ has saved us to. Now, I have to interrupt and say that I am surrounded by godly examples of obedience. People like the Smiths and Menzers and Chanelas who are 
leaving behind a church that they love to obey God in his call to spread the gospel on this church plant. Or people like my community group leaders, Phil and Shannon Vanderweide, and all the other community group leaders who are obeying God's commands to meet together, but also obeying God's commands to respect the rulers and authorities. But there's also an opportunity for all of us to grow in obedience, and I'm putting myself first on that list. True obedience is the mark of every true Christian. Not perfect obedience, but true, real obedience coming from the heart. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we do not have obedience, we do not have Christ. If we think of obedience as merely following individual commands to submit to a husband or a parent or an employer, then we'll never be able to obey God in everything like this passage tells us. Instead, our obedience must be motivated by who we are, God's children. When we understand who we are, we will be compelled to joyfully obey God. To put it simply, if we truly understand the gospel, it will help us to obey in everything. But how does our obedience relate to the gospel? How do we get from one to the other? The answer is to understand who we are obeying, God. If we understand who we are obeying, we are going to also understand why we are obeying. And we obey God in everything because he is our master, designer, savior, and father. Those are going to be my four points today. First, we obey God because he is our master. And this is the first and most obvious reason we are called to obey. Look again at verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. When this passage refers to an earthly master, it's implying that there's another master, a heavenly master. And this heavenly master is the one that we are called to obey. Obedience comes from fearing the Lord first, not a boss or teacher or parent. The most prominent theme in these three verses is the heart. We are called to have sincerity of heart when serving. Not to work and obey with grumbling and mixed motives, but to understand that we are obeying our master who is in heaven. And right beneath that, Paul says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. A very similar verse, Ephesians 6.6, 6, tells us to do the will of God from the heart. It's that same theme coming out, heartfelt obedience. And it tells us to work from the heart in everything, whatever it is, schoolwork. Yard work, busy work, artwork, woodwork, everything. And this was particularly difficult for me during quarantine because when everything went online and all of, of the campus emptied out, there was really not a lot of motivation to keep going. And it was very easy to slack off, to just skate by. And sometimes I fell into those temptations that came. If my classmates are putting no effort into a forum, I don't need to put any effort into it either. And no one sees if I leave the room while lectures playing on my laptop. But actually, it's incorrect to say that no one sees. God sees. And if I know he is my master, the one I'm commanded to obey, then I'll take my work more seriously. The command to work heartily doesn't say, work heartily in everything as long as you're in a nine-to-five office job or as long as you're in a physical classroom. Wherever you are, whenever you are doing it, you are called to work for the Lord. Coronavirus has created temptations for all of us. Whether we are doing schoolwork from home, working from home, it gives us many opportunities to slack off. Not only is the teacher not looking over our shoulder, the teacher has now left the building. But God is our master and calls us to work for him regardless of the circumstances. For the students who are online this fall, it means holding yourself accountable to honesty, even in the small things. 
And for those who return to a physical school this fall, it means standing out for Christ in small ways of obedience. It might be that one terribly boring class where everyone comes in, sits down, opens their laptop, and starts going through their inbox or playing a video game. Sometimes I've been one of those students. I've gone along with the crowd. But God is calling us to a higher standard. And if your classmates ask you why you still pay attention, tell them it's because you know the Lord sees all that you do and that he is glorified by your obedience. But God isn't just the master of workers and students. He's also the master of earthly masters as well. This is where verse 1 of chapter 4 comes in. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. While submission is specifically applicable in certain situations, it's not limited to those situations only, but applies to every Christian since all Christians are called to submit to God. Those who are leaders are not defined by being leaders. They're defined by being led by Christ. Commenting on this verse, David W. Powell says, while household codes typically affirm the lordship of those who are in positions of power, the Colossian Code strikingly departs from them by asserting the unique lordship of Christ. What he's pointing out is that in a passage on the leadership God has given to specific people, the overall point is actually that those people don't have ultimate authority. They're not the ultimate leader, God is. And this passage might not seem particularly crazy today, and part of that is because our society has thankfully grown in the value placed on women and children and employees. But in the ancient world, to the Colossian hearers, this was radical. The Roman patriarch had absolutely no accountability. He could do whatever he wanted. And this extended to the ability to inflict capital punishment on his children, to even sell his children into slavery. In short, there was no earthly consequences for a Roman father acting unjustly. But Paul reminds them that they're not unaccountable because there are heavenly consequences and their master is in heaven who will reward those who obey and punish those who do not. As Christians, we're called not to base our obedience on what society expects from us. We're called to base our obedience on the unchanging standard set in his word. Certain acts of obedience are easier or harder in certain time periods and cultures, but we are still called to obey God in everything. Now my second reason, we obey God because he is our designer. And here, if you'll look with me at verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That last phrase is crucial, as is fitting in the Lord. What Paul is saying is that a wife obeying the command to submit to her husband is connected to God's ultimate design for the entire world. It's fitting, it's right, it's appropriate, it's good, it makes sense. Just as a husband humbly submitting to the Lord is also part of God's good design. When a Christian obeys God, they are fulfilling God's plan and giving glory to God. Our obedience is part of God's good design. Children submitting to parents also fits into this, as does employees submitting to employers. I remember as a young kid, I often repeated the phrase, God's people in God's place under God's rule. And that was because my dad was showing me that it's one of the main themes in the Old Testament. It's what God wants. He wants a people for himself in a place that he's created under his rule. The only problem is that the fall distorts that. We're no longer his people. We're no longer in his place and we're no longer submitting to his rule. And throughout the Old Testament, there are, there are glimmers of hope of, re of a return to this. God's people received the law from Moses. They return to the promised land after exile. They make sacrifices according to the law. 
The promise is never complete, but there is hope in its eventual completion. Through the gospel, when you obey, you are proclaiming that you are God's person, in God's place, under God's rule. You are returning to the way you were meant to live. Your life of obedience is fitting into God's overall plan for his people. And we do the same thing collectively as a church when we gather and worship and hear teaching and fellowship with one another. The Hebrew language is a neat illustration of this. It's the only language in the world that has undergone a complete revival. In 1800, while it was spoken in synagogues and read in the Torah, there were no native speakers. And by 1950, it was spoken throughout Israel. And this didn't happen through a new law or a discovery, but through the combined actions of individuals. First, there was a revival of Hebrew literature in Europe. Then in 1882, the first native speaker of modern Hebrew was born. Slowly, small pockets of the Hebrew language began to emerge. In 1884, the first Hebrew-speaking boarding school was established. And by 1900, there were now 10 families speaking exclusively Hebrew in their home. By 1909, the city of Tel Aviv was established, which was a Hebrew-speaking city. It was spoken on the streets. It was on all the road signs. The small pockets of Hebrew speakers merged together over time, and now it's spoken across Israel. While we will never return to Eden on earth, when we obey God, it's like we're returning to speaking a lost language, our original language. We are returning to the way we were meant to act, picking up the habits and actions that were lost from us when we were separated from God, creating a community the way God designed it to be. Just like Hebrews revival started with small decisions, our seemingly unimportant acts of obedience are part of a larger picture, one that brings glory to the designer. But because two of these three commands relate to the family, we as singles can think that, can wonder if this design relates to us. It's easy to think God's good design is about marriage and the family, and that's it. That we're essentially roleless. But to assert that we can only fulfill God's design for us within marriage is to think little of God. God's design extends to all creation. In whatever situation you are in, you have a role to fulfill as an image bearer of God. And the Bible makes clear that those who are single are less distracted and can focus more on the Lord. We are able to fit into God's design in unique ways, ways that those who are married might not be able to do as easily. And many singles in this church have done this, laying down their lives to serve others, memorizing and studying scripture, discipling others, reaching out to people with the gospel. These are all universal commands that those who are undistracted by a spouse can fulfill in unique ways. When we see God's design extending to every person, we can all see how our obedience is fitting in the Lord. And that leads me to my third point. We obey God because he is our savior. The past two points called us to obey because of God's power and sovereignty. But now I want to transition to a different Motivation for obedience. God's love. God doesn't just demand our obedience as a ruler and designer. He motivates us to obey by his sacrificial love towards us. Look at verses 23 and 24 again. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Paul isn't telling us to obey so that God doesn't get angry at us. He's motivating by grace, putting in front of us the reward that we have, the reward that's in heaven with God. How do we have access to this? Our redemption. We've been ransomed. We've been redeemed. And This has already been spoken of in the book of Colossians, 
in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1, where it says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We no longer belong to the kingdom of darkness, but to the kingdom of light. And our sins are forgiven. It's only natural that we give our lives to this Savior and obey him. When we understand what Christ has done for us, then we will understand what he desires from us. We are serving the Lord, our Savior. God gave the Israelites the law only after delivering them from Egypt. He didn't give them the law, and then say, okay, deliver yourselves. And it's the same with us. He's already delivered us. He's already brought us through the Red Sea, and now he gives us the law. He commands us to obey. We who are commanded to obey Christ have already been redeemed by Christ. But to be honest, it can be very easy to separate God's work and our work. I can be one of those people who raises my hands on Sunday morning. And that afternoon, I choose YouTube over devotions. The flesh wants to separate our worship and our obedience, to make obedience its own separate thing and then slowly push it out of the picture. After all, isn't worship about celebrating that you don't have to do the whole obedience thing, that God's already obeyed perfectly? These are the lies Satan uses to drive a wedge between our life and Christ's life. If we truly love chapter one of Colossians, which is spent exalting who Christ is, we will also love chapter three of Colossians. We can't be Colossians one Christians without also being Colossians three Christians. In the same way that we can't praise God for the kingdom of his beloved son, and yet still act as if we're living in the domain of darkness. Paul places so much emphasis on grace in his writings that it can sometimes seem like our response is forgotten. But actually, there are commands to obey in every single one of his letters. And actually, every one of the letters in the whole New Testament, there are commands to obey. The New Testament authors love obedience because they love the Savior. They recognize that if we have one, we must have the other. Again, Kevin DeYoung says, only by knowing our position in Jesus can we begin to live like Jesus. And finally, my fourth point, we obey God because he is our father. Even though we might understand God as our master, designer, and savior, we can still think of God as overly demanding. But when we understand God as our father, it's impossible to conceive of God as a harsh taskmaster. His adoption of us as sons and daughters is the final expression of love. Our obedience will be overshadowed by his love, not his stern gaze. Verse 17, the first verse I read says this, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. His adoption, excuse me, in this one verse, we see our obedience connected to both Christ as Lord and Savior and God as our Father. We can't just stop at Christ. We have to go on to who he's given us access to, our Heavenly Father. But what does God being our Father have to do with obedience? What changes? What's different is that God, as our Father, is personal. God can rule from a distance. He can design from a distance. He maybe can even save from a distance. But there's no way that he can love us as a Father from a distance. He knows us as his own. In Revelation, the Bible refers to the army of heaven with Christ as the leader. But it's important to remember that the one God is both general of this army and our loving father. In the military, the overall war is what's important, what's most important. The life of an individual soldier is not that valuable 
compared with the bigger picture. Even the greatest generals, the ones who are constantly on the ground with the troops, they shake a couple hands, but there's no way they could ever know everyone who's under them. But God knows each of his soldiers as his own because he's also their father. He's not referring to you only by your ID number or your unit. He's not just looking at the combined obedience of his people. He knows you by name. Your obedience matters to him. You may feel like a small foot soldier and God is away in the war room, far away, dealing with way bigger things than you. He's the last thing on your mind. He's got so many problems to worry about. Why is he going to care about your obedience? But remember that he's also a father, a father who knows you and values your individual obedience to him. You aren't just obeying orders, although you are doing that. You're also obeying your loving father. And as we seek to obey our father, he is merciful. God isn't one of those food network judges who you know is just looking for something to criticize. No matter how good the food is, there's got to be something wrong with it. God values us and our small steps of obedience. Never once will he say, glad you finally got that down. Now you need to work on this. You're behind. He sympathizes. He is with us. J.C. Ryle says on this, just as a parent is pleased with the efforts of his little child to please him, though it be only by picking a daisy or walking across a room, so is our Father in heaven pleased with the poor performances of his believing children. He looks at the motive, principle, and intention of their actions, and not merely at their quantity and quality. If you feel like the quantity and quality of your obedience, of the obedience in your life is poor, be encouraged. God is your father and he values your obedience. Even if it's small, even if it's weak, even if it's hard. And seeing him as our loving father gives us the strength to obey his commands. It's tragic to hear stories of children who obeyed their father in in an attempt to gain his love. Situations where a father's love varied depending on how the child behaved. And obedience was motivated by fear. Our heavenly father loves us with an everlasting love. Yes, we should desire to please him, but we should never try to earn his love. The cross permanently did away with the idea of obeying our way to heaven. It can sometimes feel like illogical to say that grace motivates obedience. I mean, Paul wonders in Romans if grace motivates slothfulness and laziness and disobedience. But it doesn't because, because our motivation, if our motivation for obedience is fear, it's never going to work. Obedience as a system of earning favor will always fail. Only when we've been saved by the love of God Can we obey because of our own love for God? To put it simply, we obey from the heart when we obey God as our father. For those of you who are Christians, when God saved you, he saved you to a life of obedience. Because of him, we have a new life, a new kingdom, a new father, and a new motivation for obedience. Romans 5.19 might offer us the clearest picture of the value of obedience when it compares Adam and Jesus. For as by the one man's disobedience were the many made sinners, so by the one man's obedience will the many be made righteous. When we think of Jesus making us righteous, we don't think of his obedience. We want this passage to say, by the one man's power will the many be made righteous. By the one man's righteousness, by the one man's wisdom, by the one man's love, by the one man's authority. No, by the one man's obedience will the many be made righteous. Obedience is powerful. It's what obtained our righteousness. It's not cool. It's not flashy. It's not going to get all the attention. But our simple obedience to Christ has more power than all the advice 
of this world. Our world has lots of ideas on how to stand out, how to make a difference, how to change the world. And some of those ideas might make sense. But there's one thing we can do more than anything else that will make a difference, that will cause us to stand out for God, and that is to obey the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we obey you not just as a drill sergeant. We also obey you as our father. God, you've ransomed us. You've redeemed us. Your love is what motivates our obedience. So I pray that you would help each person here. Stir us up. Fill us with your spirit to obey. And grant that we would go forth from here as an obedient people fueled by your love. In your name I pray. Amen.